Hey guys, this is Anthony Morganti from AnthonyMorganti.com and this is part 11 of our Learn Lightroom 5 video series and in this episode I'm just going to answer some of the common questions I've received about the Lightroom videos. Before I do that though, if you guys could go down below this video and click the subscribe button and comment in the videos and like the videos, I'd really appreciate it. Okay, let's get started. First question. Often you'll hear me say that I expose this photo for the highlights. What do I mean by that? This goes back to the olden days when we used film. Um, with film, there were broadly two different types. There was slide film, which is a positive film, and there was a negative film. Uh, most people used the negative film. And the way the chemistry of the film film was, with negative film, anything that was in the shadows would tend to lose detail faster than anything that was in the highlights. So what you would do if you were shooting negative film, you would expose for the shadows. So you would overexpose your shot slightly so that anything in the shadows did not lose its detail. Because then in the printing process when you went to make, make the print, you could you retain that detail throughout until you had the final photograph. When you shot with slides or positive film, you would do the opposite. You would expose for the highlights, which means you would underexpose slightly. And the reason why you did that is so that you would retain detail in the highlights. That way, if when you printed anything from a slide, you would um, be able to um, express that detail in the final print. We're shooting digital now, and digital is a positive rendering, s similar to shooting slides. So you're going to expose for the highlights. If um, This happens mostly if you have a real bright area in the photograph like this. If I had shot this and exposed for David, this is a statue of David, all this sky area would have been pretty blown out. And uh, when it would have been blown out such that I would not have been able to recapture any of the detail using Lightroom. But I exposed for the highlights, which means I underexposed this shot. Um, underexposing the shot, of course, made David out to be a silhouette. But with Lightroom, I was able to bring out the detail in David. Conversely, if I had exposed for David, let me say this again, I would not have been able to get any of this detail back from the sky. It would have been gone. So I exposed for the highlights by underexposing. I would suggest when you take a shot and you have a lot of bright area like this, is um, you take one at the normal exposure, you take one one shot under, one stop underexposed, then two stops underexposed, three stops underexposed, bring them into Lightroom and see what you could do with them. So that's why I say usually I expose for the highlights, and I, and I usually do. Can you blur out the background using Lightroom? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, not like you can um, when you, if you use a regular, you know, any everyday lens and you shoot wide open, you could um, blur the background out a lot more effectively than you can with any software, and that includes Photoshop. Photoshop is better than Lightroom, though. What you can do in Lightroom is you could uh, use this tool, the second one from the right, that's the radial filter and reset the filter by holding the Alt key and clicking on Reset. It resets these sliders. We're going to draw the filter out on this little statue's face here. And I'm going to reposition it so it's more over his face. And what you could do is, um, with the radio filter, make sure that the invert mask is not clicked. And you're going to want to turn clarity all the way down. When you turn clarity all the way down, it blurred the background slightly. You could turn sharpness all the way down. Um, you could add noise. You could, you know, do something with these other sliders, which I don't see them doing anything. But that's pretty much the closest you could get to blurring out the background um, with Lightroom. Um, let me uh, show you the before and after. I click this little switch here. There's before, and there's after. Now. You can stack this filter and add another one on top, but what I found when you do that is um, there's so much processing power it needs. Depending on your computer, it will go real slow and it will get herky and jerky and stuff. So, um, the, really, the answer is no. Try to if you if you're shooting a subject and you want the background blurred out, just shoot at the widest aperture you can. That's a lot more effective than um, than trying to get it in post processing. 
Next question. Using the backslash key doesn't show the original version of my image. What they're referring to is um, many times in these um, videos, I've show, as I've developed the photograph, I would hit the backslash key and you would see the, the original untouched image and then I'd hit the backslash key backslash key again and it would show the processed image and that way you could see the comparison of what I did to it. Now first of all there's two things you got to keep in mind. First is the backslash key when you do this it only works when you're in the develop module. If you're in the library module or any other module for that matter it won't work. You have to be in the develop module. The other thing is this is a backslash key. There are um, two keys uh, that are slashes on your keyboard. One is forward slash, one is backslash, and the forward slash obviously will go the other way. So make sure you're hitting the backslash key. <clears throat> one thing I became aware of is not all keyboards have the backslash key. Um, somebody emailed me from Quebec and they have a French keyboard and the French keyboard, uh, at least their French keyboard, did not have a backslash key. So uh, the whatever country you're in, perhaps your keyboard doesn't have a backslash key. Um, in that case, I don't know what the key is um, the, to use. And what we're talking about to show you, this is a process photo I did in one of the episodes. If I hit the backslash key, it'll show the original um, version. This is coming into Lightroom. Hit the backslash key again, and that's the process version. That's so you could see what you did. Um, if you don't have a backslash key, what you can do is hit the Y key. The Y key will show a side-by-side -side view of the original shot and the process shot. Hit the Y key again and, it, and you're back to the uh, process shot. So if you don't have a backslash key, hit the Y key and make sure you're in the develop module too. The Y key only works in the develop module just like the backslash key. Okay, um, why do I usually shoot my landscapes at f11 and not f22 for maximum depth of field? That's true. F22 will give me more depth of field than F11. But what happens when you close down the aperture so much to such a small pinhole that F22 is, um, the light becomes what they call uh, diffracted and it will actually distort the image going through that tiny hole of, of the aperture. So usually you don't want to shoot with your aperture closed all the way down when you want to get maximum detail in the shot. So what you're doing is you're trying to find a happy medium, something that's going to give you good enough depth of field but going to give you really clear crisp pixels um, when you shoot. Usually on most lenses the um, most um, sharpest um, image is obtained when you're two to four stops shut down from maximum. Meaning, let's say you had a lens and it was f2.8. Uh, One stop down is f4. Two stops down is f6. Uh, or I'm sorry, f5.6. Three stops down is f8. And four stops down is f11. So anywhere between f5.6 and f11 is that's two to four stops down from wide open that's going to be where that lens is going to be at its sharpest every lens is different though so what you want to do is do some experimentations with your lens what I found is with the Nikon lens that I use for my landscapes that f11 is real sharp so I usually shoot at f11 now here is a shot here of a landscape and this was shot at f11. I hit the I key on my keyboard twice and it will come up. I shot it at 1 125th of a second f11. Now I was at 24 millimeters which gives you a little more depth of field also shooting more with a wider angle. But as you can see these flowers are in decent um, focus and so is the rest of the photograph. All the trees in the background, the, the grasses in the front here, and the, the water itself are pretty well focused. So yes, if I used F22, these flowers probably would have been a little better focus, but this is good enough. And it's I, at F22, the picture would have lost some clarity and detail in the finer part of the image because of diffraction. So I shoot at F11. So you do some experimenting with your lenses. Go two to four stops um, closed, I mean down from wide open. So whatever you're wide open, if you're shooting maybe your lens is f4.5 is wide open, then you're gonna wanna go um, two stops 
you know, further down would be F11 and, you know, a little further. You don't want to go all the way down to F22, though, or some lenses go down to F32 even. You don't want to do that. Um, generally speaking, it's going to, um, you won't get as crisp an in image. Do I always push the highlights to minus 11 and the shadows to plus 100? The answer is, on landscapes, I always do that at the beginning. That's the first thing I do on landscapes. Once I start processing the landscape further, though, and I set the white and black point, and maybe I had to adjust exposure, I added clarity, and then I added some, um, I added some uh, contrast, I might notice that my whites or the stuff in the brighter part of the picture maybe are, are too subdued. I want them a little brighter, so then I bring highlights up a little bit. Um, or I might see that the shadows are just too bright. So I'll bring shadows down a little bit. So on landscapes, I always do it at the beginning, and then I might adjust it later on, readjust it later on. For If I'm shooting a portrait, I almost never touch the highlights and shadows at all um, because hopefully I did exposure perfect in camera for a portrait. So I won't touch them at all. If it's an environmental portrait, meaning that's a picture of a person in the environment, maybe a picture of a golfer on a golf course, um, it's a portrait of a golfer. Um, I might mess with the highlights and shadows a little. I won't bring them down to minus 100 plus 100 though. Um, I just to you know make sure that the um, the golf course in this instance is 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 exposed properly. So I might mess around with them a little, but um, it's more to, by eye. Then I'm not doing it um, like I do a normal landscape. Um, hope that answered your question. But that's the way I do it. Everyone's got to do it. You know, come up to your own way. This gives me a good starting point on landscapes, doing it that way. On my copy of Lightroom in the develop module, the panels on the right all stay open. On yours, they close as you open another. How? What they're referring to is this right-hand panel. As you notice now, I have the basic panel open. If I um, open tone curve, the basic panel closed and tone curved open. If I open, let's say, detail, detail opened and the other panels are all stay closed. Well, how, how that is, that's just a setting in Lightroom. If you right-click on any of these panels, it's called go in solo mode. I'm going to turn solo mode off. And I'm going to open the basic panel, then I'm going to open tone curve. You see how they're all staying open now? HSL, detail, I can split toning. I mean, it's to me, this is a pain in the butt. Because what if I went up and I had to do some, I just did some lens corrections, and I decide that my... Uh, my shadows are, are are too bright and I want to turn shadows down. I have to like scroll up to get it. Um, so that's why I prefer doing it in what they call solo mode. So just right click any, on any of these panels and turn on solo mode in that way. Whatever you open will be the only panel open. All the rest will close. And that's it. Um, that's all the common questions that I've got. And um, if you guys have any questions, don't hesitate to email me. And my email address is on the screen. It's Tony at AnthonyMorganti.com. And if you want to post a comment, ask a question in the comment section under the videos, do that. I'll be glad to answer right there. Um, it might take me a while to find it, you know, to see it. So it might take me a day or so to see that. But I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. So just um, send me off an email or post it in the comments. Um, until our next video, I hope you guys are doing well and taking a lot of great shots, and I hope these videos help. And again, if you guys could subscribe to my channel and like and comment in the videos, I'd really appreciate it.